Hi, everyone. I am uh, sorry I'm a little bit hoarse today. I think I'm battling a little bit of COVID. So um, hopefully I've got enough energy to get through this. I wanted to share my experience today as a patient who has been battling HCC for four and a half years. I will go through a little bit of my treatment history and then kind of uh, go over things that I've learned just to let you guys know um, whether you are a loved one, I don't like the term caregiver, or a patient um, on how I've learned to best live. And that's what we're all trying to do here. Whether you are a patient or a loved one, friend or family, you are wanting to have more days on this earth. And why are we fighting for more days on this earth if they're not gonna be good ones filled with positivity and light and life? So let me share um, just some slides because I've had so many treatments over the past few years, it's almost hard for me to remember everything that I've had done. Let me see, um, can you guys, can you guys see my PowerPoint? Yes. Okay. All right, so here's just my treatment history, everything that I've gone through in the past four and a half years. So I was diagnosed in April of 2018. I'm somebody who was very fit, healthy, physically strong. At the age of 43, I um, ended up with this diagnosis of HCC. I'm somebody who never had underlying liver disease, no hepatitis, no cirrhosis, no fatty liver. And so how did that come about? Um, the first thing I was asked when I went into the hospital at Northwestern in Chicago was, are, you know, you seem to be a younger woman of childbearing age. Do you have a history of um, hormonal birth control usage? We know that's a risk factor. It's in the fine print on birth control. That can happen. Um, we've seen oral contraceptives referred to briefly here in one of the presentations before. Um, anyway, I was misdiagnosed several times before my correct diagnosis happened. Um, first of all, I went to see someone who gave me an ultrasound. I started noticing a lump in the upper right quadrant. He actually misdiagnosed it as being a 15 centimeter hematoma. And come to find out that wasn't it. Massaging it didn't help anything. It actually continued to grow over the next month or so. A couple of trips to urgent care misdiagnosed it, but did lead me to the ER when they said, hey, this might be appendicitis. We know it was ruled out before, go to the ER. Um, long story short, they did imaging there. They did a CT, found a very large mass, ended up quickly getting a liver resection. Um, my husband will come on and talk next after me, but this is in one of the strangest strokes of coincidence ever. I had been dating a man for about five months who happened to be on the liver transplant team at Northwestern and his team performed my liver resection. Really, really strange. You know, at the time he met me, I was seemingly healthy and um, had no health problems to speak of other than a little bit of hypothyroidism, and that was it. Um, so after the liver resection, I was believed to be in full remission. I entered a clinical trial at Emory in Atlanta, and that was just to assess um, the effectiveness of nivolumab on preventing the risk of recurrence. Unfortunately, my cancer did recur around September 2018. I've been dealing with that ever since. So first treatment I had was the Y90 radioembolization, followed quickly by a few months of nivolumab, the immunotherapy. Um, saw progression on that. I quickly proceeded to cabozantinib, followed by limvatinib, and followed by ramucirumab. So those three treatments didn't really have the intended effect on me. Um, the thing that I have been on since January 2020 that has had what they call a spectacular response in me is the atezolab, atezolizumab, bevacizumab. So I've been on the tocentric and avastin or the tocentric and invasi biosimilar ever since um, January 2020. Um, since then, I think shortly after I started those, February 2020, I had 10 rounds of external beam radiation. Um, this past I think February, March of 2022, couple more rounds of radio embolization, the Y90, and I'll be doing 15 rounds of proton therapy coming up here. And just wanna switch it back to myself just to kind of talk to everybody. Um, let me go back to, sorry, Zoom is not wanting to cooperate here. So you might go con continuing to see my slides. Um, what I'm trying to do here is just basically um, talk to everybody and say that, you know, you can live a full life. It's not, it's not easily done. It does take some effort. 
Um, this sometimes seems trite that, you know, you just have to put in the positive mindset. You can live a full life. You know, I have been certainly in some of the darkest times. There are times where, you know, my hair all fell out at the beginning of immunotherapy. That's a rather rare side effect from immunotherapy, probably related to my thyroid. I have shaved my head off. I have given away my clothes, not to make it sound super dark here, but you know, I'm not somebody who's going to come on here and tell you, oh, it's all sunshine and rainbows. I have certainly had to deal with a lot. There are times where I've had to really dig deep and be very resilient. And that didn't come necessarily from within myself. That um, came from having a good support team around me and just some lessons learned that I wanted to share with you guys. Um, let me pull up some more slides here. And I'll show you a little bit, a few things I've taken notes on. Sorry. Okay, so one thing I found super valuable is keeping a symptom diary. I didn't really even think of this when I got diagnosed, but in, in trying to figure out what was going on with me before I got diagnosed, I just had a little notes app on my phone and I would just put down the date and what was going on that felt unusual with my body. And I never intended it to be a four plus year list of things that I would keep track of, but it's proved invaluable in later discussions with my care team on, you know, this happened on this day, this symptom or this side effect popped up when I started this therapy. And it's really filled in a lot of the gaps and it's proved invaluable in talking to my care team, deciding what might have been related to what therapy, um, things that I needed to address in my treatment. So I would urge anybody to do that, whether you keep a handwritten diary or something in your tablet or phone that you can refer to. Mine has gotten so long over the past four and a half years, I'm actually glad that I can search it by keyword because I, I would have so many notes. Um, taking good care of your body, and um, we just had a, a cooking segment that's eating well, that's exercising to the best of your abilities, and don't be afraid to rest when you need to. There's a lot of guilt associated with taking time out for yourself and feeling like some days you just can't do some things. I mean, I've heard a lot of positivity, positivity around immunotherapy, and that's great. You know, there's sometimes where I'm able to go on long hikes, but there are other days where I feel like I can't take the trash out, and that's fine. You do have to listen to your body. You do have to make sure you push yourself that you're not living your entire life on the sofa if you do have that energy to get up and do something. But don't feel guilty about taking the rest that you need because when you're in treatment, your body is trying to repair itself. It's trying to heal itself. You have tumors or lesions in your body and that treatment is trying to work. So, you know, feed your body well, exercise to the best of your ability, stay active as much as you can, as much as your, your energy allows and just take good care of your body. Um, the third item there is ask questions until you are under until you understand or are satisfied with the answers. Sometimes the answers you get from your care team are not going to be what you want to hear. The reason I put this down is I started a Facebook support group for liver cancer patients a couple of years ago, and a lot of people do come on and ask questions that probably are best posed to their care team. And it's kind of clear that they're either reluctant to ask the questions of their care team or they feel like they didn't get enough time with the care team. But you really do need to keep probing, whether it's in your in-person visit or on the portal, you need to just keep asking questions because not only can they ask, they can answer questions about what's going on with you, um, but a lot of people leave these meetings with their doctors and don't really have that warm and fuzzy feeling about, okay, here's the next thing we're going to try because they don't really understand that's the best thing for them. That leads me to the next point that you hear this all the time, advocate for yourself. Um, don't be afraid to be a little bit pushy in your care team meetings. A lot of people are afraid of being rude or being too pushy or being a pest you know, I'd rather be an alive pest than a dead person with good manners. If I have to just keep asking questions, whether it's in the in-person meeting with a doctor or over the portal, just to make, make sure all my questions are answered and to make sure that whatever treatment I'm being pushed toward is the best thing for my overall health, um, 
are the side effects going to be something I can live with in the future if there is another option? If they're pushing me toward a clinical trial, is that just because they want somebody in the trial or is it really because it's my best option? Just make sure you're comfortable with whatever treatment decisions you're being guided toward. Um, the next one is kind of a, a contentious matter. I say leave no stone unturned from a patient's perspective. Don't necessarily rely on your primary care team to present you with all of the treatment options. I was being treated in Chicago and I'd come to basically the end of my fourth line therapy. Um, some HCC patients, I would say many HCC patients aren't lucky enough to get four rounds or four different types of therapy. Um, none of those were working for me. And at that point, there were no real answers for me there in Chicago. And I said, you know, hey, I used to live in Houston. MD Anderson is pretty much top dog around here. I said, I'm going to go ahead and book an appointment. And I was actually met with a little bit of resistance. I was met with a little bit of resistance in the form of, well, you can go down there. They're not going to have any more targeted therapy for you. I'm like, fine, I'm going to go down there anyway. And that's just being, me being a contrarian. And they did. And that's what I'm on. And I'm still on it two and a half years later. And it saved my life. And it turned me around from somebody who was very underweight, who didn't have the energy to walk around the block and walk the dog to somebody, you know, in my best periods, you know, I was on a miniature honeymoon a week and a half ago, walking nine miles a day. And so there is, I, I won't say there is always help out there. I think that's a little bit trite, but there are sometimes things out there that you are not readily being presented with, and you do need to dig. You need to put forth the effort as a patient Get on the internet, um, look things up, research, see what you can do. Um, even if it seems out of reach to travel to another state, there are resources out there in the form of flights, in the form of discounted hotels. Just, you know, find all the resources that you can. Google everything because there's probably some help out there. Um, this is another thing that's important. Don't be afraid to engage palliative care. So Dr. Jacob was on earlier and talked about palliative care. And I feel that there's a misunderstanding. A lot of patients hear that word palliative and they think end of life. That's not it. Um, MD Anderson actually calls it supportive care and that makes it a little bit less scary. But palliative just basically means they are addressing whatever symptoms or side effects you're having. If you're having discomfort or difficulties, whether it's lack of appetite, lack of energy, side effects from your treatment, they can step in and help you with that. So if you need to bring them in, when you are with your oncologist, you can say, hey, on my next visit, can we have palliative care join? Or can we make a standalone appointment with palliative care? That way you can say, you know, here's my list of things I really need help with. I'm not eating enough, I'm losing weight. They can help you either with drug therapy or other strategies to address things that you need to keep your body as strong as possible to go through the rigors of treatment. And that's important. I mean, that's basically what I've been doing all along is trying to keep my body just going from treatment to treatment. Um, this isn't what I would call one of the easier cancers out there. It's weird to um, think of cancers in terms of easy or difficult. None of them are easy, but there are some of them that have the good fortune of saying, okay, I'm going to go in for X number of radiation treatments or X number of chemo treatments and boom, I'm in remission. We know this is usually not that outside of, you know, certain surgical procedures. It's often a long haul with systemic therapy, local regional therapies, or a combination of both of those. Um, so you're going to need support from many sources. And that's my next bullet point, whether it's your care team, um, forging a good relationship with the nurses, your physicians, um, friends and loved ones. I don't typically use the word caregiver because, you know, I'm caring for myself. My husband does what normal husbands do, and I'm not in the position where I need somebody to give me care other than, you know, every now and then, you know, bring me something to drink. <laughs> um, outside therapists are often covered by your insurance plan. And that's something that a lot of people don't know about. I'm somebody who believes that everybody in the world could use a therapist. There doesn't have to be anything wrong with you or anything really on your mind. 
to benefit from supportive therapy, just having an objective third party to help you deal with normal human emotions and what you're dealing with during a cancer diagnosis, whether you're the family member or loved one or friend or the patient themselves, those are not normal emotions. I mean, it's something you've probably never dealt with as closely in your life. And support groups, whether they are in person or in the, um, right now in the time of COVID, a lot of them are online, such as, you know, my Facebook support group, just being able to talk to other like-minded people that are going through the same thing that you are and working to maintain your peace of mind. Sometimes that involves some tough decisions of basically shutting out avenues that are negative in your life, whether it is, I'm not talking about cutting off family members or anything like that, but if there are people around you that you know are gonna put you in a better frame of mind or activities that put you in a better frame of mind, actively seek those out. You know, do what you can because you need not just physical strength to get through this, you need mental strength. And I'm not sitting here, you know, preaching down to anyone like I'm some sort of beacon of strength because there are times when, you know, I felt like I was hanging on to the bottom rung and barely making it through, but that's what you've got to do. And, you know, I'll, I'll just wrap up and say, focus on the positive and don't forget to live. There was a a nurse that I met a couple of weeks ago, right before I went on my honeymoon. And I had the opportunity to spend about 10 minutes in the room with him while we were waiting on something. And this is a guy named Ronald at MD Anderson. And he says, you know, I've been doing this for a really long time. There are patients that I have seen that have been super clinically sick. You know, they've not been doing well on paper. And yet there's the ones that make it. And then there are some that I have seen that they, you're doing pretty well compared to others. They don't make it. And why is that? And he says, you know, sometimes you can chalk it up to how effective their treatment was and all that. But he says, there's one common theme, common theme that I have seen is the ones that tend to do well are the ones that remember to live. They are not focused on death, dying, end of life. There are some patients that are so focused on dying or end of life that they just forget to live. And that is something that you cannot do because, you know, what, again, what are we doing here? We're focusing on trying to buy more days, buy more time. What are we trying to do here? We are trying to find more days out of life. And so that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to just treat every single treatment, whether it is something that is hard to tolerate or whether it's something easy to tolerate, stretch it out as long as you can. The next best treatment may be just around the corner. And so I will switch chairs with my husband, Josh, here. Welcome, Josh. Hello there. All right. So I'm Maria's husband, Josh. Again, I'm uh, at uh, Northwestern Memorial Hospital. I was a liver transplant anesthesiologist. So when everything kind of happened, um, you know, I basically worked with knew everyone who was sort of involved in, you know, in her care. And so I'm going to talk today to about, you know, perspectives about what can one do as a, you know, as a loved one to sort of help things with, um, with, a, with someone who has hepatocellular uh, who has liver disease and help them sort of through everything from my perspectives, both as a husband, as sort of a physician. So probably the number one thing, you know, as Maria very eloquently talked about is as a patient, be sort of involved in your care. It's difficult. You go into, you see a whole bunch of different care team members, uh, nurses, doctors, uh, physicians, assistants, everything sort of like that. You get tons and tons of information and it all kind of hits you at once. And so one of the things as a caregiver, as a loved one, support giver is probably a better term, is that you can kind of help out. You can sort of listen. If you have two people hearing the things, then when you sort of come to conclusion, it can be really, really sort of you know helpful. Because again, it's a little bit hard. You have a, a long meeting with someone and then you sort of say, what exactly did they you know sort of talk about? 
So, you know, I, it was difficult during COVID, uh, not able to physically sort of be in the room. Um, when she was at MD Anderson, I was in Chicago, I was able to kind of come in and zoom. And so, you know, again, for the family members, be as involved as you can. It's not a pleasant, uh, obviously, situation to sort of be in, but you sort of have to be there anyway, learn as much as sort of you can. In you know the treatment of cancer, there's a lot of moving pieces. Okay, uh, liver cancer. There's an oncologist. A lot of times, a hepatologist. Uh, in Maria's case, she's going to be receiving proton therapy, so a radiation oncologist, uh, interventional radiologist with sort of Y90, and so. Everybody sort of is working together to sort of offer the uh, care. A lot of times everything is led by the oncologist, but not every, it's not easy for all of the, um, for all of the um, medical professionals to know every single thing that's going on. And so therefore the best person to do that is the patient and is the patient's family. And a lot of times if something doesn't get done or you're not really sure about something were these labs done, what were the result of this? The best person to sort of bring that is the patient. And with my chart and all of that sort of information being available, that's really, um, and so again, don't be afraid to sort of, you know, ask questions, has this been done or something like that? And that's just not necessarily the patient with regard to the, to the caregiver. Um, second thing, um, now that you end up having the targeted therapy, you know, the amount of advancement in cancer therapeutics has radically changed over the last you know, 10 years. You didn't really have immunotherapy 10, 15 years ago. You didn't have targeted therapy. Uh, you just had the, you know, the awful chemotherapy agents, radiation that had horrible side effects, such as hair loss, bad nausea and vomiting, all of that sort of stuff. One of the things that has been remarked to me a lot of times is that like, wow, you know, Maria doesn't look like she, you never would know that she has cancer. She looks so good and everything like that. One, that's great for people who are, you know, who are that way that you don't have to do that sort of stuff. However, people, you know, when you're on targeted therapy, even though you may look normal, a lot of times it's all you can do to just make it through the day. A lot of times Maria will talk about how she feels like she's on 5% battery. And so as a family member, as a support, you have to take that into consideration. And you have to know that, you know, there's going to be, you know, good days and bad days. There's going to be days where people are going to have all kinds of energy and they're going to feel normal. But you're going to always have to remember that there's sometimes where you just have to take things easy, uh, relax everything. The last thing that I'm going to kind of, um, the last thing that I'm going to sort of uh, finishing up talking about is, again, it's very important, I think, for a family member to be involved in the care and everything with regard to the, um, you know, cancer and everything like that. However, that can't become your entire life. And so, you know, again, you know, be involved, talk about it when you need to, but that can't, again, be an entire focus. A good way that I, we sometimes try to balance things is you're say, okay, we're going to say, we're going to talk about cancer stuff for 20 or 30 minutes, get all that sort of stuff out of the way. And then once you sort of get that part, then it's like, okay, you know, we've gotten that part out. Now we're going to focus on other aspects of our life whether or not it be, you know, um, travel, um, you know, going out, exercise, everything like that. With regard to the other stuff in your life, you know, every, we're all getting older. You're not the same person that you were five, 10 years ago. And the reality is when you have hepatocellular carcinoma, you're not going to be the same person that you were five before the diagnosis. And that's just how it is. That's okay. And so you may have to change your life a little bit. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. So instead of maybe being the big crazy travel people or the big crazy workout people, maybe you need to sort of say, hey, we need to, you know, dollar life back a little bit instead of we'll focus on, 
You know, instead of doing these crazy long hikes, we're going to just sit in a garden and just enjoy the you know beautiful weather or enjoy sitting on the couch watching movies with our dog. You know, it's not it's not the same as it was before, but it's just as good. So 